Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar. Successful SOC implementation of USB Type-C and DisplayPort Alt Mode, brought to you by Tech Online, Synopsys, and broadcast by UBM. I'm Chris Keech, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can also participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window and then click the Submit button. At this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. This will allow the slides to advance automatically throughout the event. And at the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of your console. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation. Successful SOC implementation of USB Type-C and DisplayPort Alt Mode. Discussing today's topic is Morton Christensen. Morton is the Technical Marketing Manager for Synopsys' Designware USB and DisplayPort IP. Prior to joining Synopsys, Morton was a Principal System Designer at ST Ericsson and Ericsson, designing mobile phone and modem chipsets for 19 years. He was also a member of the Technical Staff at ST Ericsson. And joining him today is Gervais Fong. Gervais is a Senior Product Manager for Mixed Signal uh, Phi IP at Synopsys. Gervais has over 15 years of experience holding product marketing and product management positions covering ASIC, FPGA, EDA, and IP products. Gervais holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from the University of California, Berkeley. And it's with great pleasure that I now turn it over to Gervais to begin today's presentation. Gervais? Thank you very much, Chris. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on Type-C and DisplayPort Alt Mode. As the newest USB standard, Type-C brings a lot of benefits in being able to handle data, power, and video over a single reversible connector and cable. However, to bring these user benefits, it makes the designer's job, your job, more challenging, or shall we dare say, interesting. In today's presentation, we plan to cover topics that are important in developing a successful SOC with Type-C. Now, successful implementation is a bold statement, so Morin, let us start by defining successful. Thank you. An, an SOC designer, his goal is to design an SOC that works first time with no expensive respins and loss of time to market, and he can do this by minimizing risk when implementing the new functionality and using silicon proven IP. Those are great goals. I, I would also add that uh, additional goals are to optimize the function costs as measured by the bill of material for the entire system using these new Type-C interfaces. And it's not just optimizing the SOC costs. And also keeping in mind the risk and time to market must be managed. Um, and finally, I think uh, in this day and age with these complex SOCs at these very um, expensive um, small geometry processes, customers must be able to reuse this SOC for multiple products or SKUs. And so the SOC must be designed to be flexible. So, Shavay, what kind of products are we talking about? Well, I would first say that, um, you know, over the last couple of decades, ever more powerful computing devices, they shrank from the desktop today's, say, for example, portable smartphones that need to transfer data, power, and video. Type-C enables these products to work on the go as well as when they are docked to a hub or a display device such as a monitor. Uh, in order for Type-C to be widely adopted in the mainstream, the next generation of SOC designs must seamlessly and successfully interconnect. However, designing SOCs for these types of products is a challenge. So, Morin, why don't we start out by first looking at the hardware and software partitioning considerations? Yes, that's a good start because the decisions you make about the software hardware positioning for Type C that affects your SOC design. <clears throat> and 
The new requirements for functionality and flexibility affect the SOC as well, of course. So we'll focus on USB Type-C display port and what's required to successfully integrate support for this, which includes the display port alternate mode, which is a new function. Uh, it's actually one of many standards that are related to Type-C. You have the USB Type-C connector, the display port alternate mode spec, of course. There is also something called the Type-C port controller, which is hardware related. There is a Type-C port controller interface specification. You have a Type-C port manager, which is a software aspect of this. And there is also something called UCSI, which is the USB Type-C connector system interface. This is operating system dependent and lives at the very top of the whole software hardware stack. Um, <clears throat> there is also something new in Type-C called dual role port, which basically replaces the old dual role device, but DRP and DRD is used interchangeably. In the block diagram that you see here, the new functions that are needed for Type-C and display port alternate mode are marked in orange. So today we're going to talk about uh, these three partitioning challenges, but we'll start with a very short overview of Type-C and DisplayPort alternate mode. So you know the Type-C connector, it's got 24 pins, which is a huge increase from the old 4 or 8 pin connectors on the, of the standard USB connectors, standard A, standard B. The connector can be reinserted either way in the receptacle, and this is possible because it's got full um, it's got it's duplicated, it's got X and Y axis symmetry. So when you flip it, then as you can see, all the signals match up, except notice that TXRX1 and TXRX2 have swapped places. And that's the reason for the type C data path switch or multiplexer which we will get back to later. And then we have the old mode, which does have complexity. Oops. Um, the, uh, the pins marked in yellow on this diagram shows which of the signals that can be repurposed from USB to, to something else when old mode is enabled. The USB type spec itself doesn't define old modes. It just defines that these pins can be repurposed, and then it's the DisplayPort alternate mode specification that defines how they're used. As of today, DisplayPort is one published alt mode. MHL and Super MHL are also published, but we'll concentrate on DisplayPort today because that's what the industry also seems to, to concentrate on. And as an SOC designer, you also need to focus on DisplayPort. So we'll start with the first challenge, the hardware partitioning. The key takeaway from this is that one solution doesn't fit all designs. Flexibility is the key, success, key to success for this. And the key to Type-C is the configuration channel. There are pull resistors on the CC pins that determine the initial function. So a source, which is also known as a downstream facing port, or DFP, or it's also known as a host, as a pull-up resistor, which is then enabled when it's in host row. The sync or UFP or device has pull-down resistors, and then accessories have pull-down resistors as well, which are much stronger than the uh, device pull-down resistor. So you can see there is only one wire in the cable, and that is key to how this works. A simple host device configuration is easy to explain. The host monitors for connection. It has a pull-up, and the pull-down on the device will win over the pull-up. So that's 
how it detects connection, and then it can de determine orientation because only one of the CC pins will be pulled down. And then the host enables VBUS. And the host doesn't enable VBUS at all times, uh, unlike <coughs> it used to do, because uh, you can, since the cable is symmetrical, you can connect two hosts, and you don't want to do that when VBUS is enabled on both of them. The device will have to wait for VBUS, and then it determines orientation. And there is also the optional feature to detect high current capability from the host, and the device can use the high current. So when you look into the specs, it's actually amazing how complex a couple of resistors can be. So I, <coughs> all I can do is I suggest you have a look at the spec. Fortunately, standard ships that implements the full type C CC functionality exists. I'll show you some examples later when I've described some of the additional functionality for type C. So <coughs> the CC function is just the beginning. <coughs> the CC function is down here in the block diagram marked in or orange. And <coughs> you can see the rest of the function blocks that's required, including the USB and DisplayPort controllers and files. Uh, focusing on just the CC function is a good start, but it's not sufficient because DisplayPort Alt Mode Discovery uses something called Power Delivery Messaging Capability. Morton, is this the same power delivery messaging as in the USB power delivery protocol itself? Yes, it is. Um, the same messages are used, but it's important to remember that power delivery messaging is not the same as power delivery itself. Um, and power delivery messaging is multiplexed on the CC pin. The power supply will then be uh, controlled by the type C port manager. And neither of this is part of the type C5, which is over to the right in this block diagram. I'll show the complete block diagrams later and get back to them, but let's start with something simpler. So all that's needed for a standard type C host device product is the USB switch, which you remember is needed because of the, uh, the super speed data path switching places when the connector is inserted in the flipped position. And then you have the CC function. However, you also need a VBUS switch because hosts don't enable VBUS until they've detected the device. And then we have something called the uh, type C finite state machine. they can get somewhat complex. So uh, let's look at how we can optimize the cost for this, because the switch that's needed for the data part can be fairly expensive. It's a uh, high frequency switch, uh, has to pass 10 gigabits per second signals for USB 3.1. So uh, in this block diagram, we have replaced the um, we have replaced the um, switch with a USB Type C phi. The Type C phi is a special phi that removes the need for the switch. If we look at the uh, GDS of a super speed phi, we see that it has a USB 2.0 part. It has a global or common block that, that implements a lot of the functions that's needed for both phi's, and it has a lane that goes to the standard connector. To make a type C phi, we add one lane so that one or the other lane is active depending on the orientation of the cable. This minimizes the uh, signal degradation you get with an analog switch. You, at 10 gig USB 3.1 Gen 2, 
you're actually down to about two inches of PCB routing when you in when you include the switch, and that really limits the kind of products you can build. Uh, you can add read timers and read drivers, but they do increase cost, area, and power. So if that can be avoided, it should be avoided. Then the DisplayPort Alt mode does increase uh, complexity of the Type-C port controller hardware. The, uh, the trick here is to separate high voltage and high current Type-C port controller functionality from the SOC. So you can so see in this, yep, survey. So more, why wouldn't you integrate the TCPC hardware into the SOC? Uh, yes, good question, but the uh, the answer is the divide and conquer approach. The SOC has all the uh, digital logic and the high-speed analog, and the Type-C port controller has all the uh, high-voltage, high-current, and precision analog circuitry. You can, you can integrate them in mature process nodes, and we can also see an evolution in this block diagram where the programmable power supply and even the Type-C port manager can be integrated in in one chip, like uh, power management IC. Uh, in this example, we've also shown that the uh, USB Type-C and display port files are combined and there is a crossbar switch in the digital domain before the files. That removes the need for the uh, fairly complex uh, digital, or oh, sorry, analog crossbar switch that's needed, which I will get back to because that's a challenge in itself. I'll go to the, um, <clears throat> I'll show you some of the port controllers that are already available now. The, the concept of a new hardware function block can be daunting for some. However, these chips exist. This is just uh, a small selection of what's available commercially these days from multiple suppliers. Some of the most popular chips are actually available as second sources, pin and function compatible as well. And many suppliers are willing to discuss the customer-defined variants. So choosing not to integrate TCP C the hardware function for Type-C into the SOC reduces complexity and risk and adds flexibility. So the summary of challenge number one, hardware positioning, is that the Type-C data path switch requirements, they are stable and they're ready for SOC integration. It it's important to separate the Type-C port controller hardware from the SOC because it is high voltage, high current, and it's not compatible with the uh, typical process nodes used for these advanced SOCs. And also Type-C port controller implementation options, you require flexibility depending on what kind of product you're building. Not pro all products are equal and not all Type-C port controllers are appropriate for a given product. So the product developer will then select Type-C port controller hardware as required for each product, which allows the SOC to be used for multiple products. The next item on the agenda is the Type-C software pa pa partitioning. So I have a disclaimer because I started as a hardware person, but after 30 plus years in the industry, I need to admit that software is important too. However, when designing today, system view is what's required for success. And that's why I've been a system designer for 15 years. So let's look at the block diagram for a complete Type-C and DisplayPort Alt mode implementation. I started by doing this inspired by the OC 
view or the OC model, which is famous because no system is fully compliant with it, but it has defined abstraction layers, hardware, software stack buildups. So at the bottom, we have the physical connector and the PHY, then we get into the links and the various controllers and protocols and applications and user mode at the top. So according to the OC model, communication and control according to these green lines up and down within the same within the same software hardware stack is fine. However, the uh, <coughs> the red arrows show the uh, non-preferred communication parts because they really make it difficult to implement this. And as you can see, when I started doing this, I realized it was just, it has to be a better way. This isn't possible to implement safely. So I went from this to this block diagram, where the existing display port and USB functions are to the right. They're completely independent and not modified from common or standard implementations. And then we have a type C task consisting of software element and hardware element. Um, and we have the switches that we've discussed as well. And when I drew this, I realized that the type C task actually formed a C in the block diagram. So this, this looks good. And fortunately, it turned out that the industry came to the same conclusions as we did when we did our system work here. The new Type-C port controller, Type-C port manager, and all the specifications and interfaces are perfectly aligned with this view that I'm showing here. Morin, what do you mean by aligned? Okay, let's show you. Let me show you one example. This is the um, this is the Windows uh, 10 USB software stack with the Microsoft provided function so software stacks in blue and third party adaptations for different hardware in green. And all they did for type C was to add these two new function blocks that is a generic interface for type C and an implementation specific uh, customer provided software stack to talk to the new hardware you have. So again, completely separate Type-C functionality that doesn't affect or tear down and require modifications to the existing software stacks. So let's summarize the software partitioning challenge. Keep in mind again that each product is different and the SOC must support different implementations. For challenge number one, we move the Type-C port controller to outside the SOC, but the, uh, it needs to communicate with the SOC, or at least it needs to communicate with the Type-C controller, sorry, the Type-C manager, the software. So the Type-C port controller interface and Type-C uh, can be used, or you can use a proprietary interface. Uh, a product developer will then implement the Type-C port manager software as required for each product, and the Type-C port manager can then execute on an embedded CPU, or it can execute on the application CPU, or it can execute on an external microcontroller, which could be standalone. It can be integrated with the Type-C port controller hardware, which is a common implementation today, or it can be integrated in the PMIC. For some of these implementations, you need a proxy TCPM running on the application CPU so that the uh, upper layers of the software and the user knows what's happening on Type-C. Um, what is important to remember again is that each product is different. However, there is no change to the existing USB and DisplayPort software stacks and hardware controllers. And the Morning. summary is really, in, yep. In the original diagram, you had a USB display port switch block. Um, it's not apparent on this block diagram anymore. 
Um, yes, you noticed that. That's good. It's no longer orange. It's no longer expensive and challenging because um, we, it's been removed. It's integrated into the Phi. And that's what we'll get to next. Let me just summarize the, uh, the Type-C port manager software partitioning. The SOC design must be flexible. It's that simple. So let us get to the uh, data path switch that switches between USB and DisplayPort. Uh, remember, we have the uh, Type-C connector here. We can flip it, and then we have these other pins that in the R again that disappears and comes back and um, can be substituted or repurposed in alternate mode. So when looking at the specifications, this is what we get. We get this table showing we can have USB only. There are four differential pairs, but for USB only, only two of them are used. The, um, <clears throat> you can see that different pairs are used depending on whether the connector is flipped or not. Then you can have USB or DisplayPort at the same time. One or two lanes of DisplayPort is supported in that case. And um, again, different pairs are used depending on the flip. And in the DSP, they port only mode, one, two, or four lanes are supported, and again, different display port main lanes on the different lanes of the Type-C connector. So the switch for the USB only multiplexer that supports USB only is really simple. TX and RX has to be switched to one lane or the other. But when you look at the what is commonly called the crossbar switch for the USB-C in display port mode, then you see it gets a bit more complex. But it's still possible to, to implement. So I'll show you how this data path switch can be implemented. There are actually multiple options. And cost, PCB area, silicon area, power, and time to market does vary between these implementations. Most current uh, implementations use an external to the uh, SOC switch, which has the highest cost, the largest PCB area. It doesn't affect silicon area because it's all external, but it, and it's low power or high power if you have to have a read driver. The time to market is short, which is why it's being used today. The dual fire approach is also used and especially useful for hosts because it allows you to take two existing files or two existing uh, super speed ports and take them to the uh, type C connector and one or the other port is used depending on the orientation while the other file or other USB port is unused. This is also used in commercial products. Time to market can be short if you already have two lanes, but it can, it's long if uh, you have to implement an SOC with two files. Power is medium. There is some loss because one of the lanes is just idling. Silicon area penalty is large, but no PCB area penalty. And cost is low if you already have it. It's high if you have to add it. We see that a number of designs today are integrating analog switches on chip instead of off chip. That has a medium cost and no impact on the PCB area because it's now integrated in the SOC, but it does have a large effect on the silicon area. Power is inherently low. The time to market is long because this is high risk and has turned out to be non-trivial to do. The dedicated Type-C file 
is the best solution because it's got low cost, no additional PCB area. The silicon impact is medium. Uh, you could even say it's small because uh, we find that the type C phi area is smaller than the combined area of the separate phis that still needs an external switch or internal switch. Power, there is no additional power. Time to market is medium because it's a new design with new IP. But risk is low. I did mention re-timers. And the question is, is if, is, a, if, is if a product needs a retimer. The channel loss budget for, for these products is fairly limited. USB 3.1 at 10 gig, you have a typical PCB routing distance of four inches. That's all you get. And if you have an internal or external analog multiplexer, you're probably down to two inches. The, um, and that does limit what kind of products you can build because two inches from your chipset to the connector, that's not a lot. The USB 3.1 official read driver is a full read timer, which is two complete files plus logic, and that has a tremendous penalty for power area and cost if you need to implement it. There is also something called an analog read driver. But that's non-trivial to implement for USB Type-C with DisplayPort alternate mode. Remember from the table with the uh, showing the different combinations you could have? You have the um, one lane is TX only, while the other lane is either TX or RX, depending on whether it's used for DisplayPort or USB. So block diagram of the analog read timer looks simple, but anyone who's ever implemented these kinds of products knows that this is non-trivial to implement because of the interactions between TX, RX, and you also need to program this. So if it can be avoided, then stay away from it. The, um, <clears throat> the summary of the data part switch challenge is um, as follows. The data part switch affects the cost, area, power, and time to market. We know, even if the specifications are evolving, that the data part switch requirements are stable. So that allows you to integrate the data part switch into the SOC. A USB Type-C file or a USB DisplayPort Phi has the lowest total system cost, the smallest area, and lowest power. So now is the right time to, to start SOC designs that will meet time-to-market requirements for optimized, cost-effective, and flexible SOCs that can be reused for multiple products and markets. So we're getting towards the end of this presentation. We'll um, start by, or we'll end by showing what's needed for a successful SOC implementation. And as can be expected, the key to successful SOC implementation that supports USB Type-C and DisplayPort is to solve the three challenges that we talked about. The uh, hardware partitioning, the software partitioning, and the data part. So if you read the specifications that I referred to, well, it requires multiple external components. So we're back to the block diagram here, the full system view. And I've also included the programmable power supply and battery charger in this block diagram. You can see that the power supply battery charger is controlled by the Type-C port manager. Remember, the Type-C port manager got the messages about uh, power delivery through the power delivery messaging controller, and which communicates using the USB power delivery Pi. Hmm. 
the uh, Type C port manager can execute, as we talked about on the application CPU, but many implementations have Type C port manager software execute on a secure MCU because uh, <coughs> a rogue application can easily play havoc with your power supply and cause connected devices to, call, to catch fire. This has actually happened at USB Type-C and power delivery interoperability events, and it's a good thing that it happens at these events instead of when a customer is holding a product in his hand. This block diagram clarifies how the new and existing function blocks connect, and it also shows that Type-C supports power, data, and video all at the same time, and most importantly, there is no change to the existing USB and DisplayPort software and hardware stacks. However, this block diagram shows the uh, orange blocks, which are additional expensive switches for high frequency, high voltage, and high current that's required for Type-C. So let's see if we can cost optimize this. This is the same block diagram, the same function blocks, in a cost power area and performance optimized implementation. The changes that have been done is that the uh, USB Type-C and the DisplayPort PHY has been replaced with a PHY that supports both. And the expensive high-frequency analog switch multiplexer crossbar has been replaced by a digital crossbar switch. The Type-C port manager controls the crossbar switch instead of the, uh, in the digital domain instead of the analog domain, so there is no change to any of the function blocks to the left. It's just rewiring of a control signal. Then the power supply battery charger, Type-C port manager, power delivery messaging controller, and PHY and the CC function, and all the... Uh, VBUS and VCOM switches and handover between configuration channel and USB PHY, even the auxiliary SBU handover for DisplayPort AUX channel can be integrated into the PMIC. And the PMIC is then implemented in a process node that is mature and able to handle these high voltages, high currents, while the SOC is implemented in the advanced process node. So the key to achieving this cost-optimized implementation is to choose the correct Type-C and display port 5 that allows this full integration and divide and conquer approach. So let's look at the uh, dedicated USB and DisplayPort 5 and the performance, power, and area advantages that it has. Performance, yes, again, no external or on die analog crossbar switch that degrades signal quality. This improves the PCB trace length budget and there is no need for a read driver or read timer for most products. The USB 3.1 and display port 5 is inherently power efficient. It has to be in order to work at 10 gig. And again, no need for read timers. That saves system power. Area, we are finding that we have the same or smaller silicon area than with separate USB and display port 5. And again, no external switch, cost optimized and performance optimized. And there is a bonus with this, because you can integrate silicon proven and certified PIs and controllers, including the HDCP 2.2 embedded security module that's needed for content protection for 4K video. Thank you, Morin. So, uh, I appreciate the, all the information on the slides. Um, I will summarize uh, the presentation. With just a couple slides, uh, just want to summarize. In addition to the USB Type-C 
and DisplayPort that Morton has presented to you in today's webinar, we have a, a complete USB IP solution that is focused on providing the lowest risk, smallest area, and lowest power solution for your SOC designs. Uh, in addition to the FIs, we also have USB controllers, USB verification IP, uh, interface subsystems, which are basically more pre-configured USB controllers and FIs specifically for your SOCs, and also uh, prototyping kits that are basically FPGA prototyping uh, boards that are pre-configured with controllers and our FIs as well as IP virtual development kits that essentially allow you to uh, accelerate your SOC design as well as to accelerate your software development while you're concurrently doing your SOC. And this is all backed up by hundreds of dedicated engineers specialized in USB who have contributed to the USB standards that uh, we build our IP to as well as participation in all the various USB compliance programs. So in summary, what we've presented today is um, designing an SOC for USB Type-C and DisplayPort from a system partitioning point of view. That by choosing mature certified and silicon proven USB DisplayPort and HDCP 2.2 controllers, connected to a USB 3.1 DisplayPort Phi with an integrated digital crossbar switch, you can develop SOCs that comply with the latest USB Type-C, TCPC, and TCPM standards. Uh, these SOCs that you're designing can be optimized for the specific cost, feature set, risk, and time to market specifications that your product requires. And properly configured, your SOC can be used for multiple product configurations that maximize your return on investment. So, three by lastly, of, using... Yes? Yes, there that's are, three uh, out of three of the success factors, isn't it? Absolutely. And so, to summarize, by um, the takeaway point is using the Type-C 3.1 DisplayPort 1.3 IP, you can accelerate your SOC design. And with that, I'd like to turn the webinar back over to our moderator, Chris, for any additional Q&A. All right, thank you, Gervais. Uh, now, before we begin with today's Q&A, please fill out the feedback form that's opened up on your computer. To complete the form, uh, go ahead and click on the Submit button, or you can click on the red survey icon at the bottom of your screen and also complete it that way. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the Q&A text area and then click the Submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left, but if we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you via email. So let's go ahead now with our first question, and it looks like our first question is going to be for either of you. And it says, uh, PMIC controls the high voltage and current rather than TCPC. Is that correct? Um, <clears throat> yes, that is as such uh, correct. In, in the, the PMIC will have the um, circuitry that controls the high voltage, high current, VBUS switches, power supplies, battery charges, etc. Uh, the Type-C port controller only identifies the orientation and determines host device role, and then passes it on to the Type-C port manager, which then tells the PMIC what to do. All right, thank you, Morton. Uh, the next question here is, uh, why doesn't Synopsys support the power delivery spec in the PHY? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, the answer is that um, power delivery is high voltage, high current. It belongs in the PMIC, and it doesn't affect the data part, which is what the PHY handles. So going back to the block diagrams, completely different parts of the total system block diagram and no interaction. And again, not trying to support power delivery in the PHY in the advanced process nodes allows you to partition 
the design, the total product design into chips that can be cost effectively implemented in different process nodes. All right, thank you, Morton. Our next one for you, how much engineering time should I expect to take to develop uh, the Type-C port manager software? Um, yes, good question. It depends on uh, your starting point. It's, I wouldn't say it's a non-trivial software task, but it's fairly well understood. There are open source uh, submissions from a couple of com companies already out there that can be a good starting point. Uh, and if you buy a standard Type-C port controller chip that has a built-in MCU for Type-C port manager software, there are reference designs that are part of of the delivery from the vendors, that is also a very good starting point. What I would, so so anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of months, uh, depending on whether you start from scratch or use something existing, and of course, depending on the complexity of your pr product. What I would like to mention, though, is that doing certification, compliance testing, and interoperability is important, and that's probably going to be the most important part of this, although that's not for the SOC designer, that's for the product designer. All right, thank you, Morton. Our next one for you, how many uh, inches of the uh, FR4 does, does this file support, and then uh, what is the, what's the power uh, at uh, 10 gigabytes per second per lane? The, uh, the answer to the first part of the question is typically four. Four, four inches, but it really depends on the quality, of FR4 and uh, because some some products have used low quality FR4, but typically four inches. As for the power, we'd like to reply to that uh, privately. But the uh, right. as I said, the it's inherently a low power design, so uh, it's quite okay. All right, thank you, Morton. Our next one for you. Why, why does Synopsys support uh, DisplayPort alt mode and not HDMI alt mode? Aha, uh -huh. that's an easy question as such because there is no HDMI alt mode defined, only DisplayPort at the moment plus the MHL. So if HDMI alt mode specification is released, that's definitely something we will be uh, looking at and. Uh, consider supporting. All right, thank you, Morton. Next one for you, it says USP, uh, USB PD 3.0 mentions uh, something about authentic authentication. Where is this supposed to be implemented in the software or the hardware? The uh, Type-C authentication spec, which was released a couple of weeks ago, um, uses PD messaging and PD 3.0 uh, is an enhancement to the current PD2.0. It allows somewhat longer messages. Uh, authentication doesn't really affect <coughs> the data part or the functionality. Authentication is basically uh, the purpose is for a host to recognize that this device is what it says it is, that it has a certificate that the, the host recognizes this certificate hasn't been tampered with so that it's a trustworthy device. It could, for instance, be that you've connected a, uh, a keyboard that doesn't contain a keylogger, or that you connect a thumb drive that doesn't masquerade as a network interface and sends all your secret information onto the net, the dark net even, perhaps. So. It's uh, it's part of Type C, but it's a completely separate functionality that uh, can be implemented on top and, or rather, to the side of all the existing function blocks that I've shown today. All right, thank you, Morton. Next one for you. Uh, with this spy, is the the uh, with this spy is the read driver not needed for the PCB trace only, or does it include uh, a USB cable? Uh, Okay, the first part of the question is simple. The read driver is normally not needed because you've got sufficient budget to route your PCB. But again, it really depends on the length of the PCB that you need to, to route. As I said, four inches or so is what can be supported. Above that, you do need a read driver. But
with four inches is considerably better than the two inches that you typically have left if you use an analog switch for 10, at 10 gig. Um, the second part is the cable. Well, the second part of the question is about the cable. The cable specification doesn't change. The, uh, the cable has its budget. The host and device also have their own budgets, and you can't, you can't let the device or host borrow from the cable budget that, because then you will get into interoperability problems. So if you can't meet the uh, host or device budget with your design that without the re-driver, well, then you have to, to use a re-driver. That's, that's the way Type-C is specified, and that's the way interoperability is ensured. All right, thank you, Morton. All right, next one for you here. Uh, why why are PD chips uh, to be used in embarked active cables, and why is the hardware to be used uh, in cables? Is it overkill? Mm, no, the, the uh, poverty delivery functionality allows you to to send up to 20 volts and up to 5 amps, and uh, sending 5 amps through a thin cable, well. You shouldn't send it through a tin cable. It should be a cable that is somewhat thicker and and certified for five amps. So that's why you need the marker in the cable so that you know that the cable is capable of this. This is a standard part of the power delivery functionality and specifications. There is also a sort of PD marker or the equivalent functionality for the Type-C uh, display port alternate mode because the, the chip in the cable will tell the host that I'm not a USB cable, I'm a DisplayPort adapter cable. So again, PD messaging is used for the same, or is used for, reused for this purpose. All right, thank you, Morton. Looks like we have another one for you. Does the FI require two calibration resistors for both the USB and DisplayPort portions? Or can the PHY uh, share the resistor to both? Uh, we can answer that question uh, privately. So we'll get back to that via email. All right, we'll move on to the next one for you. Is, uh, is, is the PMIC, uh, is it already available in the market? Uh, the power management ICs are typically designed to be an integral part of a chipset together with the SOC. So there are third-party or standalone multifunction PMIX available. Uh, I'm not aware of any PMIX today that includes everything, but uh, they are getting there. So uh, watch out for announcements from the PMIX manufacturers, but most likely the PMIX will be uh, chipset specific and designed by the same company that does the SOC. All right, Morton, it looks like we have just one more here for you. What is the availability of your USB Type-C IP? I'll hand that question over to Trevay. So we already have uh, customers that are using our Type-C IP, and specifically on the DisplayPort and uh, USB 3.1 IP today, we have that available this quarter. Um, for those that are interested in more information, please contact your local Synopsys uh, representative for more detailed information. All right, thank you, Gervais. And I'll take a real quick look here and see if we have any uh, time for another question here. Just give me just a second. Looks like we have time to sneak one more in here and then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, this is for either of you. BMC through CC is, the, is only supported, uh, right, and BFSK through VBUS is uh, deprecated in, uh, let's see here, in, in USB PD latest spec? I guess that's a question yes. for you. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I can comment on that. It is correct that the binary frequency shift keying mode, which was specified in USB D, USB D 1.0, has been deprecated. It never caught on in the industry. So, uh, all products today will use Type-C and BMC only, which is a baseband modulation, which simplifies the implementation tremendously compared to the old BFSK through VBUS. 
All right, thank you, Morton. That looks like all the time that we're going to have for questions for today. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, it, we will get back to you via email. And for the more specific questions, you'll also be having someone get back to you uh, via email. And once again, we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. And within the next uh, 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Once again, we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Successful IOC Implementation of USB Type-C and DisplayPort Alt Mode, brought to you by Tech Online and Synopsys. This webinar is copyright 2016 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright uh, by Tech Online and Synopsys, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Synopsys, Morton Christensen, Gervais Fong, I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for joining us. And we hope you have a great day. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar. Successful SOC implementation of USB Type-C and DisplayPort Alt Mode, brought to you by Tech Online, Synopsys, and broadcast by UBM. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically.